David Stewart, thank you so much for taking the time for joining me today to have a conversation around how COVID is impacting on different populations. And I'm really happy that we were able to talk to you, um, both as a gay man, but someone who is intimately involved and has been at the forefront of pushing harm reduction and peer support within that community. So, so thank you so much. I've already kind of told people what your name is. Do you want to tell people roughly what your job is, kind of what, what you've been doing for the last 10 or 15 years so people can just have an idea who sure. you are? Sure, and hi Adam, thanks. Um, my name's David Stewart. So I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an activist, I'm also a social worker, I'm a civil servant, I work in the NHS and I'm also, um, my job is really, uh, I'm, a, I'm a drugs worker. I sit down nearly all day with people one-to-one -one and help them make changes around their own drug use, set goals um, and work towards those goals and develop the skills towards achieving those goals. So I specifically work with gay, bi and queer men who sort of engage in chemsex or party and play culture. And that's sp specifically using drugs, particular drugs for the purposes of um, making sex better. Fair enough. And where are you in the world? Oh, I'm based in London, so I'm in the UK. I'm in a, I'm in a country where a thousand people are dying every day from COVID at the moment, at the time we were filming this. Which is April 16th, 2020. And we'll have that up the front, but it's probably worth saying. So I'd like to start by asking, what's been the impact of COVID on the gay community? And what's been the impact on gay men and drugs and chemsex? Like, is it any different to any other population or drug use i guess it is oh it is and it isn't you know it's uh it depends how much time you've got and what perspective you got i guess having to stay in and socially distance and isolate is is the same for everybody um having to give up doing drugs not that anyone's saying you have to but if you do drugs socially and chemsex is usually 80 percent of the time about having sex with other people on drugs so we're living in a time where people are being told to stop having sex and stop using your drugs recreationally now chemsex or party and play sort of uses more recreational by definition so we're not talking about if, if your head is full of the stereotypes of heroin users or street alcohol dependent people where stopping is more complicated than just being told to. Um, chemsex is more recreational for the larger part. So just the same as anybody else, there's a whole lot of people that sort of go, oh shit, I've got to stop doing this thing that I enjoy so much and I've just got to stop doing it for the greater good. That message takes a while to sink in for a lot of people. You know, a lot of people, whether they're using drugs or not, um, have been alarmed by COVID and, and the new circumstances. And the t first time we're delivered the message to stay in doesn't always hit home. And the second time, we're normally dealing with our own fear and how it affects me before we can think of the six degrees of consequences after that. But So that's why we have to keep delivering the message. So there's a whole lot of people that are only thinking about, you know, if, if I'm not going to catch COVID because I'm young and healthy and don't have underlying conditions, and I want to hook up with another guy to do chems, with who's also young and fit and not no underlying conditions and not really a danger of COVID, what's the harm? Um, and some people can only see that far because we haven't delivered the message enough that maybe the Uber driver that hooked you up, maybe the grocer you'll see the following week, or maybe the person in the pharmacy will have a mum or a dad who will die because you hooked up. So, I mean, just delivering that kind of harsh message is hard enough, I guess, for anybody. What makes it different, I think, for gay communities is for the fact that um, for as long as I can remember, I've been told to stop having sex by every religion in the conceivable world, every conceivable religion in the world, except Buddhism, I think. I've been told to stop having sex by Margaret Thatcher and by governments and by my homophobic dads and by religions and by health messages during an AIDS epidemic, stop having sex. And for most of those people, I've just gone, you know, fuck you, um, in, in defiance. And that defiance and that activism that defines my generation of gay men and that defines a, a, a whole movement and it defines a whole population and a whole attitude. You know, fuck you, don't tell me to stop having sex. I will do as I please. Don't intervene on those rights. So now that we've got... But at the same time, that, that community hmm. was also very early in, in, in terms of kind of engaging other people within their population and providing peer support and looking out for each other. So, I mean, the gay community perhaps better than any other defined population, is really used to dealing with virus epidemics 
and having to look out for themselves and having to change their behavior in response. Well, it's true. I mean, so they're very, very true. So, I mean, now that we're being told to stop having sex and we actually do have to, uh, unless it's having sex with someone who's we're sharing a household with, or unless it's um, just doing drugs alone, which, which has some harm reduction messages that need to be delivered again also. Yeah, I'm part of a community that has had to be very cautious about the sex and socialising, sexual socialising we do or die as part of the AIDS epidemic. But what that also, so, so I guess there's a whole lot of skills um, where there's a, a big healthcare community that's really good and really sex positive about delivering those messages that was really ready at the beginning of COVID to adapt these messages um, to, a, uh, to talk about sex really easily in this kind of context. That was really, really good. I think what was also, no, you go on, ask me more questions. Um, so I'm just wondering, so lots of people, gay and straight, won't be hooking up in bars, sleeping with different people. Um, some of those groups will be moving online to engage and use drugs socially. And I've spoken to a couple of people who have taken part in online Zoom sex parties, you know, at a distance, but, you know, engaging, sharing, participating. Is that something that some groups of the chemsex community have kind of moved to, to maintain social networking and being able to take drugs within a virtual social environment? Easily. I mean, chemsex and technology have been married from the beginning. Chemsex is almost defined by the technological sexual revolution that happened at the same time it all happened. So I think any person that you found probably on the planet that engages in chemsex would be able to tell you the tech part of their chemsex uh, enjoyment or, or life. Um, whether it's um, having a wank to get hard before you go to the sauna or having a, um, or, or, wanking with other people or watching porn, watching porn, watching porn, obviously. For some people, it's about um, hooking up with some people and having some great sex, but spending the last 10 hours of the session just wanking home alone. And that's, uh, that, so it's an easy adjustment in regard to COVID times to be able to make cam sex or, uh, or using technology to help engage with others in a sexual way. It has, we have to be cautious though, because people who are using drugs alone, um, when we're talking about GHB, when we're talking about crystal meth and methadone, and where there's psychosis involved and a potential um, overdose, where you're in a group of people and other people can keep an eye on you and check you're okay. And, and also when you're home alone with a webcam on or just watching porn, you can indulge a little further, if you know what I mean. Our, our aware of being observed socially has gone so we can take that bigger hit and take that bigger high. Some people can't tell if we've overdosed, so it's we have to be very particularly cautious about just saying, hey, go online, do your drugs alone, it's all okay. It's actually, we have to be uh, cognitive of all of the elements here. Okay, so, so you, you, you've thrown in something that I kind of wasn't expecting. So what, what I was gonna say is for the majority of gay men who don't use drugs and the majority of gay men who use GHB don't use it all the time. For the majority of that group, do you think they've probably just gone, well, I can't go to a club I can't have random sex with lots of people tonight, so I'm just not going to bother with GHB and Crystal. Like, um, I'm just going to have a break. Yeah. I mean, there are lots of people who enjoy soccer, um, and now they can't, and so they just stop doing it for a while. And it's annoying, but they do it. It's the same with chemsex. Some people have stopped, because chemsex is mostly recreational. But it, on the, for a lot of part, it's not too. For a lot of people, drug use and compulsions to use drugs and sex the compulsion that is sex, these are so related to something so primal, related to the reward center in our brain, would you understand better than me? It's so primal that what we learned, again, during the AIDS epidemic is just telling people, if you don't use a condom, you'll catch a deadly disease. And we thought, intelligently, everyone will do that. Who would want to die? And what we learned is human behavior, human compulsion, the reward center of our brain, sexual desire, and the urgent need to medicate unmanageable emotions or sort of addiction kind of trauma. These are more powerful than reason. These are more powerful than intellect. And so governments and public health services saying, please stop doing drugs right now. Please stay home and isolate and, and be careful. It's not to be assumed that people can just simply do that. It's Absolutely. a bit hard for a lot of people. Do, do you think there's a possibility that 
some people who previously were using a drug like GHB to facilitate and enhance sex may now be perhaps using GHB to manage anxiety. It's not licensed for that. I don't recommend that. And I remember talking to you years ago when it was about GHB is used for sex, socializing and sleep. You don't use it to come down. You don't use it for anxiety. You don't use it for more than three days. But we worry about people having a bottle of G and going, I feel a bit anxious. Oh, is there a risk people are going to suddenly start using G more often? Yeah. Well, firstly, I, I miss our old conversations too. We must do this again when this is all over. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think I've seen on a lot, of, I've seen that a lot of people have started to drink more while they're home alone. Again, it's a very similar thing to G. So G and alcohol are really similar in the way that they can numb you out. Being um, on our own, for a lot of people, the, I, I would say you'd probably agree with me. I think Adam, that one of the, the major way up like 95 plus percent of people who, um, use drugs in an addictive way in a self in a self medicating kind of way are doing it because the experience of being alone with your thoughts with your emotions and your traumas and your memories and all of that noise in your head that has been inherited through your growing up and through your traumas being alone and undistracted with that some people find that really hard they really need to medicate that alcohol is perfect g is perfect these are two probably in the planet, heroin too, of course, the, the drug's most beautifully designed to numb you out from that kind of noise in your head trauma. And now we're being told to stay in on your own, be alone with your thoughts and your emotions. So we do have to prepare for the fact that a lot of people are going to want to medicate that and design our, our, our health messages and our support services to, for, to support people like that. Just being safe. Go home, you're safe while you're on your own and you just stop, stop doing chem sex. Great. It's more complicated. Sometimes making people do more drugs in that isolated self-medicating way that you talked about. Have there been any particular um, policy or government responses in the UK that you're aware of that have particularly targeted the gay community to help manage the issues that you've talked about? Or is it being left to people like yourself and other advocacy groups to try and support their own community? Probably not the right person to ask. I, uh, you, you know me, I'm kind of that loud, busy activist that just works and doesn't always pay attention to what's happening around me. I think I remember reading some government report where chemsex was included in the guidelines. Um, but mostly, I, I know there's loads and loads and loads of brilliant support, especially in regard to chemsex. There is an online support. There's so much stuff online, so much. There's so much chemsex harm reduction information. There's so much talk about it. There's so much online interactive support and there's so much online information. And there's enormous amount, a lot less actual face-to-face -face support with skilled workers for them, a whole lot less, which is really worrying. So, so it's sort of in reverse. But I do see a huge community response um, and from governments around the world too that are responding to, to chemsex and to these things we're talking about culturally competent sort of interventions in regard to drug use. So at the end of this, David, if you can send me some of the links to some of your favoured resources, we'll make sure we put those up at the end of the video so people you know, have access to them. Mm -hmm. So now I want to kind of drill down to how do people who like using G and Crystal keep themselves safe during periods of isolation other than just making sure their use doesn't creep up, are there any kind of key do's and don'ts and any refined harm reduction messages that you want to get out there? No, yes. <laughs> the only thing I really want to say is uh, we do have to stay in. I want to deliver that message again that every time we hook up with somebody as instinctive and natural and harmless as it seems, it really does cause someone else somewhere in the world to die. So just one person making an exception might not, but you're not the only one. It, it, you're one of many. So it's the same as voting. It's just, just do it, please. And if you're not capable of doing it, if your compulsions or your cravings are too strong and overwhelming, do reach out. Don't isolate. I mean, the, the word socially distant, social distancing, I, I prefer physical distancing because you can be very socially connected using technology. Do it, do it, do it. Find the, the, the support networks, find the people to talk to. Even if it's an hour long Zoom chat with a mate every day, it has a huge effect on um, calming that thing that happens in our head that we need to drown out. So do all of those things. Um, stay in, support your health services and, and save lives by doing so. 
don't do drugs if you're capable of stopping them at the moment because doing them alone is a little less dangerous. But if you're doing them, access the harm reduction information that's there and stay connected to communities in that safe way using technologies. Fantastic advice. I just want to think about GHB. So you and I have done lots of talks around how to use to avoid overdose, how to avoid kind of pick up tolerance and develop dependence. There is possibly a group of people out there who were either G dependent before COVID or because of escalating use now G dependent. And because of difficulties accessing supplies, I worry about a group of people who may be at risk of going into withdrawal. I mean, you know, it, 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 even if you plan your GHB withdrawal, it can sometimes be difficult to find service in many countries that understand how to manage it. Do you think just between us, we could give some guidance with a big fat medical disclaimer that withdrawing suddenly off G can be, you know, scarily life-threatening with fit? Can we say to people, that if you're thinking of reducing, you could think about reducing your dose boy. If you're using, let's say, a, a mil and a half, two mils every two to three hours, and you were worried about running out, you could reduce your dose by 0.1 to 0.2 mils per dose every two to three days and gradually reduce yourself down. Is that a reasonable strategy for people to think about? Or do we just go, don't go there. If you're going to withdraw, go to A&E. Do you mean generally or during COVID times? I'm thinking, listen, I think, it's a, you know, you and I will both know people whose supply is suddenly being cut off and they're in problems. In this instance, they may know the supply is going to be cut off and they may be thinking, well, what do I do? I use 25, you know, mils a day. I've got, you know, 300 mils left. I don't know when I'm going to get more. What am I going to do to avoid running into serious withdrawal? Well, you and I have both been, uh, both know each other's histories. We've been working with people who use G before we even knew it was physically addictive. So we were right there at that curve where we were wondering, why is that person getting sick when they haven't done it for a while? And only just really learning that. And, and things aren't that much better. I mean, if I'm working with someone tomorrow who's from a particular borough in a certain part of London and he's G dependent and he's going to run out, there are some boroughs that just won't do it. There are people we can't help with G detoxes, just can't. I, I hate saying that sort of 15 years after the effect and after all of the activism, the work you and I have done, there are still places um, in the world and um, people we can't help with a medicated G-tox, uh, D detox. And so, yeah, the, so the, the work we have to do is what you were just describing, which is reducing bit by bit every day by Point one or two of a mil each day. Every single dose you do, you will reduce it by like 0 0.1 or two of a mil. And you would do that day after day after day after day. If you are capable of being that methodical, um, you can Google GHB diary. A lot of um, gay drug services have those diaries on their websites for you to download. So you can actually do it by the diary. We'll include this in a link afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think during, during the, the most urgent advice is whether it's COVID times or not, just because there's, um, we're hearing reports about our emergency services being overwhelmed and you think, oh, gee, I don't want to bother anybody because, but I've run out of G and I'm worried about the symptoms I'm having. If you are feeling panicky, if you've run out of G, you can't get any more. If your hands are sweating and you're starting to sort of have confusional periods, perhaps, Adam, you could describe this better than me, do go to A&E. That's what they're there for. They're not going to deprioritize you because of other COVID things. I'm speaking for England. I know it's different in other parts of the world that are having problem with their emergency departments, but you still ha are entitled to call for an ambulance, call A&E, go there and get that kind of help because it's life-saving and your life is as valid as anyone else's. Absolutely, absolutely. So the final thing I want to ask you about, David, is that for lots of the other people I've spoken to who are involved in drug policy and drug treatment, there is a sense that we are going to learn from COVID and that it's possible the treatment service delivery and drug policy is going to change forever. In 12 months time, what would you like to see the changes to drug treatment and drug policy to be in the UK? with with reference to gay men and chem sex? How do we learn and come out of this stronger? I don't know. I'm, 
I, I, I think if it, you weren't asking me specifically about chemsex, I'd probably say well, what, what we're all doing is we're learning how to Zoom and do remote support better and use our technologies better. And, and that's a, a, a really good thing that everyone's going to learn. In regard to chemsex, I think this is, chemsex is so associated with technology and it's such a new field within sort of gay, bi, queer health sectors. So it's, technology has been a part of it anyway. What I'm finding is kind of the reverse. So the, my, my issue with in regard to chemsex activism around the world has been a huge investment in the technology, in the harm reduction information online, on the information online, on the websites that sort of um, talk about it online. But the number of cities that actually offer skilled, I don't just mean um, a bunch of gay guys who do chemsex being able to have a group together. I'm talking about a skilled, somebody, a skilled worker that can sit down one-to-one -one with people who engage in chemsex. Someone who has some skills with some, um, all, all, knows all the harm reduction information, but also has some skills in some psychosexual, psychosocial responses, um, behavioral support, um, understands sort of addiction and dangers and uh, can do those risk assessments. Someone that can sit down face to face and, and manage all of that shit that goes on. Because when somebody is struggling with, with drugs, it's really frightening. I want to stop on Wednesday, but every Wednesday I keep doing it anyway. I say I won't do it this Wednesday, but oh, I did it, even though my sister was getting married. What's wrong with me? There must be something wrong with me. I don't want to know what's wrong with me. I don't want to make ch changes. I don't want to admit there's anything wrong with me. I have to do anything at all. And then they dump that, all of that in your lap and say, help me. And if that is dumped in the lap of an unskilled person, people deserve better care than that. So in, in regard to your question, it's, it's sort of in reverse. I don't want to see more tech response to chemsex. I want to see more real-time, face-to-face, skilled support, one-on-one -on -one with chemsex people. It's not happening much around the world. Do you think offering face-to-face -face support over video links could actually reduce the stigma and barriers for people to engage in treatment? You know, lots of the drug treatment services in the UK are not very friendly to any group of people who use drugs, let alone maybe someone who has got a job, goes to work in a shirt and tie, happens to use gene, walks in and sees a clinic full of people came for their methadone. It's like, this is not my place. We know services aren't very front facing. Could telehealth actually make treatment for gay men who use drugs better by lowering the barrier and offering them access to people like yourselves? Yeah. That, yeah, that, that, the more Zoom and remote can be helpful, absolutely. I just really, th there is a lot of it um, in regard to chemsex support. It's been a very technologically based thing. The chemsex response globally has been very tech heavy. It hasn't been heavy on the, on the other bit. So more Zoom, yes, more technology, yes, more information, more harm reduction information, yes, it can never be enough. Please, um, personal connection you want in the same room you want we need to improve that i you know you know me i i work independently as as an activist so every day i get and i'm not kidding every day i get between 100 and 300 emails from people around the world who sort of want some sort of help nearly all of them are saying there's no help in my city or there's no help in my area and sometimes there is they just haven't found it sometimes that they're too nervous to go or sometimes it's not culturally competent but my job is to help help try to encourage them to have faith in that service or to get in touch with that service for them to help but mostly i'm getting emails from people saying i want to talk to someone in real in real world in face to face because remember i'm, I'm not a therapist in a, a therapist a qualified psychologist or somebody a person is assessed the, the patient or the client sitting there has is sitting there going i've reflected on what i want to do I'm ready to, for therapy. I mean, ready. I'm going to commit to this contract and here we go. Now, Adam, you and I are drugs workers. So you know that when a person is presenting with drug use, it's like, I want to stop, but I sort of don't. And don't call me an addict or anything because I'm not. And I sort of, I, I need to stop doing this because my life nearly dies every weekend, but I don't want to stop. So I sort of want the solution. I want to eat my cake and not eat my cake. So I'm, doing, I'm going to be angry with you because you're going to get it wrong. And, but I'm really desperate and crying as well. And all this conflict is wrapped up in this huge anger ball that's about to explode. And I'm going to log on to Zoom and try and deliver that to you and help you fix it. It's for just personal experience. That's such a bundle of, of angst and crisis that I adore. And a really skilled person face to face where there's really good empathy engagement um, can really help unravel that untangled, complicated ball. Because a lot of people just go, just can't handle that huge weight. 
you, you reminded me the really important difference from a user perspective of the difference between being assessed and feeling understood. Yeah. One is tick, tick, tick. What do I need to know to give you treatment? And although that you know, comes from a good place and I do lots of that, it may not be the right way to engage someone who wants to feel understood. Because if someone doesn't feel understood, they're sure as hell not going to go ahead with your treatment plan. When someone's nervous about, um, okay, let's say chemsex. So let's say I'm going to sit in front of you, Adam. I've never, ever heard of you. I need to tell you that I put dildos up my bum for three days that didn't fit. It's really sore. I shaved a bit on my penis from overwanking. I don't know if it's overwanking or if it's a syphilis sore or something else. I did it by myself for 15 hours watching extreme porn that I'm kind of freaked out that I was watching that stuff. And i have done this every week and I can't stop. And I don't want to admit that I've got a problem because I don't have a problem. I need to talk about this and find a way to have the, all of this de-shamed because there's nothing wrong with doing all those things, but you, I want the help, but not if you're going to shame me at the same time, because I don't know if you get this stuff. And so I'm going to try and trust all of that to you over Zoom. So my experience with people engaging in Chem6 is it's sitting in my waiting rooms and, and that I see is people who really are sitting in the waiting room and they're, you know, they're assessing you. Will I tell you all or will I not? And so much of this gorgeous, relationship this interaction does does really require human connection so I, I i don't want to see covid turn an extraordinarily necessary part of drugs work which is that human face-to-face -face, turn it into lighten that and make it much more lenient on zoom conversations it, it, it's it's such a perfect place to end david because i think the temptation for so many people in drug treatment is to go Remote treatment is the answer. More efficient, cheaper, and you've brought it back to basics, which is at the end of the day, the thing that predicts positive outcomes is that relationship you have with that person. And so much of that is formed before you've even said a word, which is yeah, beyond body language. And I don't think even if both you and I stood up now, gave a twirl, it's not the same. I get it. And... I feel, um, I feel kind of uplifted as, that, as a place to end, actually. It's like there's embrace technology, but it's never going to replace, you know, being able to shake someone's hand, give them a hug, reassure them, and, yeah, just know who that person is in 3D, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know you have the same heart as me. I know you, I know you know that. Um, so listen, thank you so much. We might come back and check in again and see how the goings. But um, really, thank you so much for your time, your experience, your passion, and for putting out those really important messages that you just can't repeat enough. Yes. Thank you, Adam. And so the question that you chose to ask, will it be better where we're going? And though the answer I don't know for fact, Just taking it one day at a time Still don't know what I'm trying to find Really I don't mind Cause I'll be fine Yeah I'll be fine Yeah No longer focused on yesterday And I don't care The rest will say Whatever they want What's left to say What's left to say